When I started this film about causes and solutions to the climate crisis, I had no idea that I'd be spending so much time looking at water. Water governs 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet, Earth. Water. Nor did I realize the beauty in a pile of shit. That is the perfect poop. The right consistency, the right height, with a little dollop in the middle. And of course, we should add that this doesn't smell. At all. Right. No, no, no. That's just really a gift. Uh, from the cow uh, to the ecosystem that has been providing her with nutrition. It's beautiful. I had believed, like most of my friends and colleagues, the popular idea that the climate crisis was caused almost entirely by the rise in carbon emissions in the atmosphere due to our excessive burning of fossil fuels. And that the solution was renewable energy. I would even made a film of it. I see now that I was only looking at one of many parts and one of many solutions to the complex climate crisis. I was eager to save the planet. Save the planet? What? Are these fucking people kidding me? Save the planet? We don't even have to take care of ourselves yet. We haven't learned how to care for one another. We're going to save the fucking planet? The people are fucked. Of course he's right. It's not the planet that needs saving. It's us. So this new insect destroyer contains a lot of DDT. Its DDT content is even higher than government specific. This diabolical weapon of modern science kills billions of insects. Man, with this newly discovered force, has at long last gained the upper hand in our age-old struggle. We humans in the so-called civilized world have the insane habit of destroying the very thing that keeps us alive and healthy, the very thing that regulates our climate, the system of life. In other words, the activities of all the organisms on Earth. The good news is that there's a growing movement of people who are solving the climate crisis by regenerating life. They are actively working with nature to restore the forest, fields, wetlands, and oceans. I mean, it's possible to regenerate every ecosystem, in my view. To rebuild the soil. If you want to solve the problem of climate change, you don't need any technology. You just take care of the soil. To grow healthy food and to build healthy communities. Uh, it's not a garden, it's a community garden, and that word community garden is very, very important. It's in food. We can bring justice, equality, and liberation for It was exciting when I realized I had to go back to the basics and piece together a new understanding of climate change. Ecologist Stephen Harding pointed out that while people have been destroying nature for most of human history, things took a turn for the worse in the 17th century. I mean, it's a very complicated, long story. I think the, the final rupture happened during the scientific revolution um, with our dear friend Descartes. He was the one who told us that we are fundamentally disconnected from nature. And he told us the whole universe is nothing more than a vast machine, soulless, dead, and therefore available for us to use as we wished for our own purposes. This way of thinking allows human beings to look at nature as if they are outsiders. 
setting the stage for the exploitation of the land and the people. The scientific revolution also introduced a method of thinking called reductionism. The idea is that we can understand something by breaking it down into smaller and smaller parts. Well, reductionism is helpful and it's used all the time. It can be very limiting. It is this way of thinking that increasingly narrowed down the multidimensional climate crisis to first the greenhouse effect, then to one part of the greenhouse effect, the greenhouse gases, then to just one of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and then to one of many sources of carbon dioxide, the burning of fossil fuels. Scientists now believe that increased quantities of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are leading to a significant warming of our planet, possibly within the next few years. Tragically, this narrative, because it includes only a part of the problem, is missing many solutions. Having just made a film about the radical scientist Lynn Margulis and her symbiotic worldview, I knew that there was another way of thinking, a holistic or ecological approach that takes into account that everything is interconnected and interdependent. In other words, everything causes everything else. The Gaia theory that Lynn Margulis developed with Jim Lovelock proposes that all of life on Earth is one big self-regulating and self-sustaining system. Despite modern society's drive to separate itself from nature, we all remain a part of nature. We are a part of a, a great big entity, Gaia, that uh, is regulating our planet. There's an active temperature regulating system, and when we look around, we see that it is really the, the sum of the organisms and their activities that have the potential for regulating the temperature. Lynn Margulis also taught that science is about asking questions and knowing that often the best answer is a better question. So how do the activities of all the organisms on the planet regulate the temperature? My research began when I was introduced to an organization called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. We wanted to change the climate conversation to include the vast power of biology, which is widely misunderstood and underrated. On their website, I found a treasure trove of scientific papers, articles, and videos. I read many authors who were exploring alternative sometimes radical narratives about the environmental and climate crises. A book by Slovak engineer Mikhail Kravcik and his colleagues, Water for the Recovery of the Climate, A New Water Paradigm, became my indispensable guide. Then a lecture by Australian scientist Walter Yena totally blew me away. I'm really a soil microbiologist from Down Under. Most of my time I spend just quietly underground, you know, just doing work there. Walter travels and teaches extensively, and I was able to spend two weeks with him in the mountains of Vermont, learning how water cools the planet. The climate of the planet is governed biologically. The vegetation of the planet are the tools, the instruments that help drive that. And of course, we humans then influence that vegetation. But the question is, how do we do it practically? And of course, the answer is very simple. You're standing on it. You're standing on your own power and agency. Because underneath us is soil. And if I go down and I basically pick up a handful of soil, that soil is a sponge. 
and that's a sponge that can actually infiltrate the rain, retain that water in that soil, make it available for plants to grow, and make it able to drive that hydrological cycle. That's the story in a nutshell. But backtracking, the first question Walter and I explored was, how come our beautiful planet has a temperature within a range ideally suited for life? The conventional wisdom was that it was just luck, the Goldilocks principle. The planet you live on is not like a Everything just right to produce the biggest merit of luck. However, in the mid 1800s, Joseph Fourier, a physicist who studied heat, calculated that based on its distance from the sun, the Earth should be much colder. Because if we were just a rock in the solar system, an inert rock, we would be 33 degrees centigrade cooler. We would be frozen, all the oceans would be frozen, there would be no life on land, we'd be a little bit like Mars, which is a frozen planet. But Earth is warmer because life on Earth developed a greenhouse effect, greenhouse warming effect. The greenhouse effect warms the planet because certain gases in the atmosphere, called greenhouse gases, let the incoming energy, sunlight, through. Then, as the land warms up, it re-radiates infrared heat upward. The greenhouse gases absorb some, but not all, of that re-radiated heat. Imagine a greenhouse gas molecule. It absorbs heat, and then sends it back out in all directions. Because they send some of that heat back down to the Earth, collectively, the greenhouse gas molecules warm the atmosphere. And it's that re-radiated infrared heat, which is absorbed by greenhouse gas molecules, largely water vapor, also CO2, and that, in a sense, creates the natural greenhouse effect. It came as a surprise to me when Walter explained that water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. The water vapor that's greenhouse effect is about 80% of the gas effect compared to the CO2, which is about 11%. And about you know, 9% is the methane and nitrous oxide, CFCs and others. But then the real shocker came. Irrespective of how many molecules in the air, the thing that determines a greenhouse effect is the amount of re-radiation coming from the Earth. Because we have bared this soil, this soil will heat up much, much more so than a soil protected with green vegetation that is still moist. I want to measure the bare soil of this plowed field. So that's 133. All right. This infrared thermometer measures the heat or infrared radiation coming off the surface. So now I'm going to go over here to the grass. Eighty-eight. That's forty-five degrees Fahrenheit difference between the bare soil and the grass-covered soil in the same sunlight. An absolute more we clear the land, physics dictates that we will have to re-radiate all that energy back, and that is a drive of the greenhouse effect, and that is what we have grossly disturbed. We have created five billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland on this land surface, 14 billion hectares. 40% of the land area is now absorbing Heat because it's bare, it's dry, and re radiating massive. But by keeping surfaces cool and moist and at lower temperature, we can effectively turn the greenhouse effect high down to simmer. 
We can do that within days simply by keeping landscapes cool and moist. Then Walter explained to me that the earth has both warming and cooling processes. Good morning. Uh, here we are in Vermont, August, and we've got up very early before the sun's come out. To look at these beautiful, misty miasmas that are rising from the vegetation. As soon as there's light, the plants open their stomata. These are these little pores in their leaves, and basically then they start releasing water. Water that they've accumulated over the night from the soil, and the water vapor they release very quickly condenses and forms these misty haze micro droplets that we see in the air. These micro droplets are liquid water. When the sun comes out and warms the mist, these micro droplets evaporate into water vapor, which is a gas, so we don't see it. And that water vapor again warms the atmosphere because it becomes a primary greenhouse gas. So there's this dual warming effect that has evolved, very much related to the level of water in the atmosphere. But of course, if that was the only process that was there, we would warm the planet, warm the planet, warm the planet. And that's exactly what's happened on Venus, because it's gone into a super greenhouse effect. Progressively, it's got warmer, warmer, but on Earth, another process has evolved. And basically, it's a process by which this water can be removed from the air, and nature does that exquisitely efficiently by producing clouds. And then those clouds reflect a lot of the incident solar radiation back out to space, and that cools the planet below. Clouds, those massive bodies of water, have a tremendous effect on the Earth's climate, and it's hard to untangle the warming from the cooling. At any one time, more than half the Earth is covered in clouds. Most of us don't think very much about the atmosphere because, well, we don't see it. Go to any reputable source and you'll find pie charts that show that our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and the remaining 1% are trace gases. Of these, carbon dioxide represents about four one hundredths of 1%. But don't let that very small amount fool you. There's always enough carbon dioxide in the air to supply carbon atoms, the building blocks of life, to all the world's plants. The atmosphere is a very busy place. In addition to gases, the atmosphere is teeming with soot and dust, bacteria, fungal spores and viruses, and all kinds of chemicals produced by plants, animals, and other organisms. These are called aerosols, and as we'll soon learn, these tiny airborne particles play a tremendous role in the climate. When you smell the garlic coming from your friend's lunch, that means a garlic aerosol has traveled from his mouth to your nose. One day I found myself studying these pie charts and asked, where is water vapor? That's a guess. It turns out that water is just too variable to fit into pie charts. Water is the original shapeshifter. It exists in our daily lives as solid, liquid, and gas. All three are in this shot, but you can't see the water vapor gas. The amount of water vapor in the atmosphere varies from less than 1% to about 4%. And if you include liquid water and ice, there's more water in the air than in all the world's rivers, 10 times more. And the amazing thing that gives water the ability to cool the planet is evaporation. 
When water evaporates from liquid to vapor, rising up in the air, it requires 590 calories of energy for each gram of water. The water vapor takes that heat energy upward, cooling the area below. Of course, a lot of this stuff is just common sense. We know that on a hot, sunny day, it's good to go into the shade. And how great it feels when the rain comes to cool things off. <laughs> Come on with the rain, I want to We each participate in the hydrological cycle every day. And cool ourselves by sweating. Well, that sweat to evaporate, again, needs 590 calories of heat energy, which cools your body down, your surface body down, that 590 calories. Just to add to that picture that plants sweat too. Plants cool the area around themselves by evaporating water off their leaves. It's called transpiration. What a plant's doing with its leaves is not the holes in its leaves. It opens them up to take in CO2. For every molecule of CO2 it takes in, it loses hundreds of molecules of water going the other way. That's water that's then sucked out of the ground, through the roots, up the trunk, and out the leaves. Now, every molecule of water, when it evaporates, is absorbing heat. So it's basically pumping heat out of the, the ground layer, the soil, and the vegetation, and pumping it into water molecules that are carrying that heat. Well, those, well, well, that water vapor then gets high enough that it condenses and falls as rain, then it releases heat. But that's up higher. What Tom Goreau is describing is called the small water cycle in which water sucked up from the soil is transpired by trees and comes down as rain over the same environment. So this rain outside my studio may contain water that was recently evaporated from this very area, the Hudson Valley of New York State. It's a local water site. But what's even more astounding is that trees and other organisms release many of the aerosols, those tiny airborne particles that are necessary for mists and rain to exist in the first place. The aerosols, these are actually organic molecules produced by the plant. They're often a lot of the fragrances and aromas and you know, smells that we get from the plant. And they're actually acting as nuclei, micronuclei to actually coalesce water vapor around them to make these haze microbes. To form clouds, nature has evolved another group of precipitation nuclei. And these are largely biological nuclei that coalesce about a million of these haze micro droplets to make a cloud droplet so nature has actually balanced the hydrology, the heat dynamics of the atmosphere with these two balancing, opposing biological processes. The formation of the aerosol micronuclei, which create the hazes to warm the planet, and the formation of these larger hygroscopic precipitation nuclei that form the clouds and actually then later on form the rain. And rain cools the earth. So not only do trees need rain, rain needs trees. Water. That's what I'm getting at. Water. That right? Water is the source of all life. Several times of this earth's surface. The oceans are a gigantic part of the biosphere and have a tremendous effect on the climate. This whale poop, captured by ABC News, supplies nutrients for phytoplankton, which produce aerosols that seed clouds and rain. So rain needs poop. The oceans contain 97% of the water on our planet. Of the remaining 3%, which is fresh water, 2% is in icebergs and glaciers which leaves only 1% for all of our freshwater needs. 
That's not a lot of fresh water to go around. Luckily, there are natural processes that bring fresh water to the land. One such process that I knew nothing about is called the biotic pump. Mm, the biotic pump is a mechanism by which large forests can transport atmospheric moisture inland. And we have rains and we have rivers and life thrives on land. If we destroy forests, then we don't have this uh, flow, and the flow can be reversed, and the land becomes a desert. Theoretical physicist Anastasia Makareva developed this important idea with her colleague, the late Viktor Gorschow. As water is pulled from the soil, travels up trees, is transpired through leaves into the air above the forest, and then condenses into mists and clouds, it creates a low pressure zone in its wake, and that literally sucks humid air in from the ocean. A series of such biotic pump cycles can transport water inland for thousands of miles. Eventually, much of this water joins the large water cycle as it travels through streams and rivers back to the oceans. The large water cycle is another way fresh water is brought to the land. As water evaporates off the oceans, forms clouds, and then travels inland, it dumps that fresh water onto the land. It's evacuated. If they're still here, they better have a safe place to be. When we see these big storms, that's the system trying to cool, trying to cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and it does, it works. The, the people, there's been arguments about whether the amount of water that came up and landed on Texas and Louisiana during Harvey, was it uh, 30 trillion gallons or was it 33 trillion gallons? So it's some big number in the trillions. And 30 trillion gallons, when it condenses, releases the energy of Thousands of Mount St. Helens events. This is a huge amount of energy trying to get away. And I, I always thought it was converted into wind, but it turns out like maybe 1% of it was turned into wind. The rest of it is energy trying to radiate away, trying to get this extra energy out into space. So these storms are getting bigger and bigger. That's one of those big ironies I ran up against. Hurricanes cool the planet. So we're going to see bigger storms as long as the oceans keep holding the heat. The problem is, um, it's going to take a while. Believe it or not, there's an opportunity here. The opportunity is, the oceans are warmer now. They're putting up more moisture. There's going to be huge storms. There's going to be more rain. Let's keep the rain on the continents as fresh water longer. Use it to grow things. And then maybe we'll have a chance. And I'm afraid our engineering plan oftentimes is to send all that good fresh water back to the ocean too fast. We got in this thing in America where we thought, let's run all the water down to the dams, then we'll irrigate. <laughs> but when the water comes down, we have to hold it. The beaver plan was to hold the water on the continent as long as possible, keep that fresh water upstream. Beavers are nature's supreme hydrological engineers. We had tens of millions of beaver making ponds everywhere. They, they trapped out the beaver before the biologists could even study the process. And that's when the land started to desiccate. Climate change is upon us. It's actually impacting now. It's intensifying now, particularly in these hydrological or water-related processes. Hurricanes, Floods, storms, droughts, the whole the ridification of vast regions and with the ridification of wildfires. And so we've got to step back behind that to say, well, why these extremes? And what we've in a sense lost, critically lost, is the actual buffering and regulation that used to exist in the climate. Okay, so what buffered and regulated these extremes and gave us predictability? One piece is that 
idea of the soil sponge being the basic infrastructure for life. And, and it's because of its structure and function. If you look closely at soil, it consists of lots of little particles, and between them, lots of air spaces. Each little bit of dirt is enclosed in a sticky substance called glomalin, which is a protein produced by fungi. When the rain comes, the water is held in this soil carbon sponge. So it's filtering the water, it's absorbing rain, it's reducing flooding, it's reducing drought. We've had extreme floods in the Midwest this year. Yes. Tell us about those. We've had extreme flood because we've had this extreme variation of rainfall. But on top of that, compounding that, is we have effectively concreted our catchments. We have hardened, destroyed the soil structures in those catchments. And so those soils now are able to hold perhaps 20% of the water that they did 100 years ago. So this will bring up a, a winter wheat crop, but you can see here how, how powdery the soil is. There is absolutely zero biology in this. It's very difficult you know, to even hold it in your hands. When I visited Andhra Pradesh, India, I was shown a comparison between living soil that holds water. Humus is forming. You can feel very much beautiful. And dead soil. Closer here is the white layer. <coughs> what the chemicals like was PAP, urea, phosphorus, potassium, ammonium phosphate. We have a single super phosphate. Even if you pour the water, it will not infiltrate into the soil because it has formed a layer, a chemical layer, which acts as a cement. So it will not infiltrate. So the water that should have been in those in soil reservoirs has rushed off in the flood peak. And we're almost by dictate back to drought. As we aridify our climates by design, we create the probability of fires under dry periods. Fires need fuel, and it can only burn when it's dry. If the soil is wet, the grassland is wet, green, it doesn't burn. I was introduced to Linda Gibbs, who watched her house in Malibu burn on television news during the Wolsey fire in November 8, 2018. Then, a few days later, her son managed to visit her ruins. Major's house, Brennan's house, the other house, active fire from the stones from the gas lines. The fucking studio. Are you kidding me? Their studio was spared because it was surrounded by Linda's well nurtured garden with soil that held the water. Keeping the sponge, we retain more water in the soil. We have more water for trees to take up to stay moist for longer so they're not vulnerable to fire but also we provide more water to the fungi that exist in the forest that are the natural agent for breaking down dead fuel. Fires aren't just the result of global warming, they are a significant cause of the problem. Remember in Vermont, we saw those beautiful human aces that warm the air? Here's an ugly version. Every year, we burn 400 million hectares of forest and over 2 billion hectares of grassland. And those fires are putting up carbon particulates into the air. And they serve as aerosols. Every year, we burn 8 billion tons fossil fuels in our industrial ecology. So the aerosol load that we have put into the atmosphere is immense. 
and of course the humid haze that result from that immense. From Cairo to Beijing, we now have the Asian toxic brown haze that's basically persisting, aridifying the country underneath and causing people immense health problems, emphysema and other crises. To reduce these hazes, the burning of forests, crop residues, waste, and in particular, fossil fuels must be reduced. So as you watch this film and learn the many ecological solutions to the climate crisis, don't for a moment think that excessive burning of fossil fuels isn't a big part of the problem. To confuse myself even further about water, I talked with Gerald Pollack, who explores water at the molecular level and has identified what he calls a fourth phase of water. The water gets transformed from the ordinary H2O molecules into something that's actually ordered. And that's what we call fourth phase. We see this fourth phase as a surface of this pond or the shell of these drops. The fourth phase is a lattice of H3O2 molecules, which have excluded the hydrogen ions. My conversation with Gerald Pollack got me thinking about how little we know about water. Scientists have had a proclivity to stay away from the subject of water. And the reason is that there have been some scientific debacles that have taken place over the past uh, 50 or so, 60 years, that have been most embarrassing to famous scientists. Two of them practically lost their careers. So Gerald Pollack knows he is heading into dangerous water. But he knows too, that despite the tremendous pressure to conform in science, the only real scientific breakthrough is come when one breaks through peer pressure. Well, once you realize that the water can have an ordered state and a disordered state, and with vastly different physical properties, so many things become possible because if you never consider it, uh, you may miss a critical point. I see bankrupt ideas that people just cling to because it's the tradition to, uh, to cling to them. Very few scientists are, shall we say, crazy enough to challenge the establishment point of view. When you don't challenge the establishment point of view, you don't get revolutions, and we need them. How come the cloud stays up? Right, right. You never thought about that. So this is blowing my mind a little bit, but that's good. Only a little bit. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> So how come the Earth has a temperature beautifully suited for life? It's because life, the vast biodiversity that exists on the planet, cycles shape-shifting and energy-transporting water through the soil and trees, through the atmosphere, and back again, warming and cooling, creating its own moist temperature-controlled space. Earth wouldn't have a temperature suited for life if it didn't have life cycling water. The, the water and living landscapes narrative, the soil health narrative is invaluable. So being able to build a movement that is bipartisan in which people who are disagreeing about lots of other things can say, I want a landscape that helps my community and communities around the world have clean water, reduce flooding, be resilient to drought, have enough food, 
have fewer conflicts over land, have the beauty of diversity, diverse life, all, all of that. Who can disagree with that, right? <laughs> All of that. And where do they go? Well, I've seen this three times already, and every time I watch it, there's something else that, that strikes me. So hopefully you can pick something out of that. I don't know if there's something somebody would like to share in particular that they saw that surprised them or interested them. Um, we got some reflections on that. And I sat at Wednesday, and I'm going to say, I sat at Wednesday, and I'm going to say it again because a lot of people kind of like this. Said. I said, Luther, we are Lutherans, and Luther said, if I knew the world was ending tomorrow, I would still plan to me today. I think it's Lutherans, we need to say, in order to have a tomorrow, we need to plan a tree today. I feel like I've heard the whole thing about greenhouse gas. <laughs> greenhouse gas is the news kind of that's a negative. You know that when you build, oh, you have to have soil to absorb water. You, you know, so, but this explains the whole vast cycles and complexities that nobody ever talks to. It talks about it. And, you know, surely planting green spaces is a piece that we can do, you know, on our own property or advocate for in our city or our county. Um, and and the fact that greenhouse gases are helping the earth, um, you know, I, it's it's kind of not like it. Just curious what the where does it go? Um, they go as we have the water first, that's the next cycle. And then just takes a look at how that will end up helping to feed the world. Um, so how it feeds us by taking care of the, the soil and the, the allowing the hydrological process, it's you know, the food process um, for those that carry us forward. I think it gets real hopeful at the end because it's fairly easy to remove soil, and a lot of local farmers and small farmers have such an important place. I don't know. Why do you feel like it's real hopeful at the end, George? Just because it does pull it into like a, my niece is taking an uh, environmental sciences of U of so I could participate in some classes with her. One of them's urban farming. So last year she had me putting cover crops in all over my yard. You know, and, and just the different things that, that we can do with that are hopeful, or even this last statement of who can't join in this conversation about wanting something that's a, as vital, as beautiful um, as it could be. Everybody can be participating. Before I read, it's open up with possibility that uh, hydrogen. Uh, generated cars instead of uh, electric would be even better because the end result. And that is interesting. I just listened to a, a talk the other day about a scientist saying that basically because of our data centers and our electric use of electric vehicles even, it's going to increase our demand by 100% in 25 years. Um, and so it, that's not all going to come through solar. That's all going to come through wind. So what are some of these other sources that aren't going to require as much uh, energy to, to produce or to use? So there are people out there already thinking about these, these things that we'll get to hear about. And this was just a discussion of how do you make up for the Snake River dams as I talked about removing. And the amount of solar panels and windmills is just astronomical. 
cost for that to make up for it. So what other possibilities are there? Hydrogen, there's like a nuclear, you know, what, what what's it gonna take? Geothermal. Yeah, so but it's it's available. It's available. Well, I thought that what they said about um, keeping the water as far from the ocean as possible, as long as possible, reflected on um, taking down dams because we do keep a lot of water behind those dams and release it as it's needed. What would happen if we released it? Well, we know we've seen historical pictures of what happens when China flood every year on um, Columbia. So it makes it a doubly more difficult to decide whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. It does, because then you also talk about the, the, the back of water behind the dam and how that affects the environment as well. So you get a lot of, uh, if the water is too low, it gets too hot, sometimes streams, so fish and other aquatic life couldn't exist even in those. So it, it would have to be a threat. So there are a lot of a lot of issues where even, um, again, if the, the land is not absorbing the moisture, forest fires and stuff on the hills, take out the dams, again, yes, a lot of water is just going to rush right into these uh, areas, and that's what they're talking about down in the Klamath right now, where they're removing dams in Northern California. Um, just at least in the short term, there is going to be some major flows and flooding of water, um, and it, it takes time. It takes time to, to fix an area after it's been dammed. The Elwha has been very successful. Um, and uh, yeah, that dam, but it also didn't produce a lot of energy, so it wasn't a huge loss there. But some of these others that we're talking about uh, produce a lot of energy, energy sources. So, one of the issues I didn't hear a lot of discussion about is the fact that uh, our economic system values a certain form of productivity uh, that. And bodies land with value. Uh, we don't take account of the ecological services that land that's not improved can provide. And it's that lack of the ability to ascribe value to ecological services that actually distorts our economy, rewarding those things that machines need in the environment as opposed to those things that deserve it. Absolutely. Well, you can uh, put your land in a trust and get um, uh, tax credits from Pierce County, I know. So a lot of people um, have farmland that's no longer being used as farmland, but they, but they get some value, value that way. And um, so if you think about it, you got land. So I thought the uh, segment on the guy taking the temperature on the winter versus the grasses from the North Sea because it really uh, goes against all these developments with the desert, uh, where basically they don't have any vegetation. So we're creating even hotter communities. And then uh, it's very common if you drive across Washington State, half the ground is stockwood. So they can grow better crops. So again, yeah, keeping up just by like keeping the vegetation on. There are a lot more farmers that are looking into, especially the cover crop idea, um, to use on the off season. And not only that, again, maintain moisture and set it up for later periods, um, which is a very positive for it. But it also then can support provide nutrients. So a lot within the cover crops and can just go right back in the nutrients for the for the soil. Touch pro as well. <laughs> um, right now in our flour is making flour from sustainable wheat. Have you heard about that? It's brand new market. It just came out this week. It's called AEY. And it's it's going to be better for the planet than the other we can use. It's going to be expensive, but I don't use even on the flour, so I wouldn't mind spending the extra for getting a better product. For stones, huh? For stones. <laughs> 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 
Are you are you ready for school? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, before you get, I can't sign up for all of May. You guys have to, but if you guys sign up for all of May, then come June. I'm just saying. I'm just I'll saying. I'm just Don't get signed up if you want to go. Well, one of the basic behind everything problems is what I call wealth theology. The most important thing in life is to make as much money as possible. To get as much stuff as possible rather than to give. So what gives life? Giving. Getting destroys it. And don't forget, you can bury your compost. Yeah, you can have keep your own compost and use that as well. You can compost yourself. <laughs> and that, my wife and I have already signed up. So, from Yakima County, we were matching composters. So we took classes of composting where we had to then go out to teach composting. So, yes, I compost. It's a good plan. Well, we're getting close to noon. and appreciate you all being here. And uh, we'll see if there's enough interest. We can play the rest of it at a different time. If it is two hours, and about an hour, I could probably sit around for two weeks and watch. So let's break this up into chunks, and it is the bio. Thank you. Thank you.